It's Sunday in the Peking suburbs. A woman is asking for a piece of meat with fat on it. Another one says, don't you have something leaner? It's fatty. It's too fatty. Give me one yuan's worth. Here, these two are for you. Poor Xiao Hong, I completely forgot your candy. But you don't mind, do you? Here it is. Give one to Xiao Wang. Go on, give him one or I won't buy you one next time. Go on, give it to him. Did you transplant your flowers? I'll water them for you later. This year, I think we'll have a lot of pomegranates. Hey, be careful. The young woman is Gao Shulan. We've often had dinner with her in this room. This is her brother's house. During the week, she lives here because the factory where she works is nearby. On Saturdays, Gao Shulan goes home to Peking where her husband lives. Forget the candy. Come on now. Let's sing. Go ahead, sing. 
Ready, go. Gao Shulan's brother and his wife. Is Yao Chen going fishing? No. How come he doesn't fish anymore? He has no time. We don't have the same day off, so I never see him. His day is Monday. The other day, a whole group of us went fishing. But the fish weren't biting. The neighbor, who is a cook, is preparing cakes for the entire courtyard. They'll be stuffed with rice and jujube and steam cooked. Each year, these cakes remind us of a 2,000-year-old legend. One night, the poet, Xu Yan, was walking by a lake. He saw the reflection of the moon on its surface. He mistook the reflection for the moon itself and tried to hold it in his arms, and he drowned. The people who loved the poet came and threw rice into the lake to keep the fish away so they wouldn't devour Xu Yan's body. This is Xu and her family. In the courtyard, everybody calls her Big Xu. Did you find any thread for me? No, I didn't. Let's see the net. You see, I need some. The mesh is too small. You already have a fine mesh net. Yes, I keep an extra just in case. I hear the water level is down. We could go fishing this afternoon. Fishing again? Why not? Every Sunday it's the same story. He takes off and leaves me with the housework. The fish are for you, too. I see we're still arguing about fishing. Leave them alone. At least we'll have some fish. We'll have some fish, so why complain? Come on, Xiao Hong. I'll buy you some picture books. No, why don't you stay? Goodbye. Goodbye. Look, we need to relax a little. I don't mind that, but things pile up around here. And Sunday's our only day to clean the house. All he thinks about is having fun. The house can be cleaned any time, but the fish can't wait. I won't stop you from going, but you have to help out here too. You complain a lot about fishing, but you don't mind eating the fish. <laughs> I thought you had to write up your critique. I'll do it tonight. What do you mean tonight? We'll take care of it tonight. I'll help him. Come on, let's go. All right, but don't stay too long, unless we drown. That's what worries me, so don't stay too long. Don't worry. Come on. Go ahead, I'll catch up. In front of Brother Cao. So what? What's wrong? Are you afraid of Brother Cao? Could you speak softer? Why, are you afraid? No, it's not that. You talk so loud. I don't like it. Well, you ought to know me by now.
子进场，大声唱。使劲唱，使劲唱。Go ahead, say hello. She's not always this nice. You have two children. That's enough. It's nice to have a boy and a girl. Xiaodan, do you want a baby brother? Tell her no. I agree, but my Xiao Hong asked me for a little brother every day. She probably gets it from Grandma. At the factory, a lot of women have three or four children. That's bad for their health, and sometimes for work, too. Hand me the chopsticks. Mom's a fast worker. Almost as fast as me. The stuffing's a little dry. How long have you lived here? Let's see. About ten years. Eleven. Since 1962. Where did your family come from, and what did they do? They were poor peasants. Before liberation, we didn't have enough food and clothing. We had built, mom remembers, a three-room shack on a small plot which belonged to the landlord. I had nine children. Three died. I only have five left. Four died. One of them works at the power station in Zhekiangsheng. One works here in Fengtai. I forget which factory in Fengtai. 
That's right, an auto repair factory. Shulan is at the locomotive factory. And the youngest is in Honan. He's a soldier. I was only eight when I became engaged. My father had no money, so he went to see his cousin to borrow a pig. He sold the pig to get some money. But then he couldn't pay back his cousin. So he said, here, take my daughter instead. His daughter for a pig. My father said, take my daughter and we'll be even. His cousin said, all right, we'll forget the eight yuans for the pig. Our house, if you could call it that, had only three rooms, really just two and a half made of adobe. Our house had low ceilings, and my husband was very tall. He used to bump his head a lot. The roof was so low. In those days, feet were bound very tightly, and the bindings were sewn up. Foot binding was part of our oppression. I cried a lot, but they forced me. It was very painful. I had to lean on something in order to stand up. I couldn't even walk. At what age was it done? Around six or seven. Six or seven. Now it's all over. It's wonderful. In those days, in spite of our tears, they would bind tighter and tighter. Our feet were deformed. They would get infected. The toes were crushed together. Yes, the bones were broken. It was unbearable. If you had big feet, no man would marry you. Before taking a wife, a man would look at her feet. And on the wedding day, when the bride arrived, everyone came to look at her, or rather at her small feet. They would admire her small slippers and their fine embroidery. In the old society, people thought the more sons you had, the richer you'd get. People don't think like this anymore. I've got one child too many. <laughs> don't be silly. I have two sons and a daughter. Really, one child is enough. Two at the most. Shulan has just one child. That's best. Yes, if only Grandma wouldn't keep telling Xiao Hong, ask your mommy for a little brother. If I had to take care of another child, my work would suffer. I feel better with less children. That way I'm free to study and work, especially now. <laughs> I'll try to convince grandmother. When I got married, I was almost 19. And how old was his wife? She was two years younger. 17, right? Did your parents arrange the marriage? Yes, of course. I was engaged when I was only 10 years old. 
In the old society, marriages were arranged by the parents. What did you think about it? I was against it, but what could I do? Our parents made the decisions. We weren't free. You were against it. You were against it. What did you know about it? You were even younger than me. I was against it anyway. Our parents made the decisions. All I could do was obey. In your case, love came after marriage. What is the family income? The family income. Together, my wife and I earn about 110 yuan a month. For these three rooms, the rent is about 6 yuan. Just under 6 yuan. Yes, that's right. 5 yuan 72 fens. Then there's the electricity, electricity, running water, garbage collection, and street cleaning. In all, it comes to seven yuan, or just under seven yuan. Do you pay income tax? No. <laughs> Here we only have to pay rent, electricity, running water, clothing and food. We used to pay taxes under the Kuomintang. Do you ever quarrel? Sometimes with my mother. Sometimes there are problems. For example, when my sister buys something, if everyone doesn't agree, then we argue. Quarrels? Yes, they argue about things like that. Aside from that, sometimes Xiaoyan's mother scolds Xiaoyan or her brother for dressing up too much. The grandmother steps in. Otherwise, it would never end. Parents aren't always right. Children have the right to disagree. Family relationships are different now. We discuss politics. For example, when something political happens at the factory, we talk it over. We're almost out of dough. And pass me the flour. Mother often says, eating dumplings reminds me of New Year's. In the old days, poor people only ate them on New Year's Eve. Today it's like any other dish. Don't put too much flour in or the dough will crumble. Drink. Drink up. Or you won't get anything else.
Combien de personnes vivent dans la cour? How many people live in this courtyard? There are seven families all together. About thirty. How many people? Thirty-eight. Thirty-eight. That's a lot. <laughs> Most of us are workers at the February 7th factory. We know each other well. We talk together. We go for walks. On Sundays, for instance. We get along very well. Once Li Yaotong got sick in the middle of the night, and we all got up to take her to the hospital. We're all good neighbors, but it wouldn't be true to say there are never any problems. For instance, my mother had a plant. We were all waiting for it to bloom. When someone cut all the buds with a pair of scissors, Mom lost her temper and started to shout. Big Shu heard her and thought she was shouting at her child. They held a grudge for a long time and stopped speaking to each other. In general, we get along. We help each other. There are three grandmothers in the courtyard. They're in their 60s. They do the cooking and take care of the children for seven families. When everyone's away at work, they're in charge of the courtyard. We help each other. It works pretty well, in spite of some differences from time to time. Go on, eat. Eat. Your stomach hurts. You ate too many apples. The three grandmothers usually come to our meetings. We meet here in the courtyard to keep an eye on the children. <laughs> Another thing that happens a lot, we end up eating the same thing for dinner. If Big Shu hears there are green onions at the market, she'll say, hey, let's go buy some green onions. And we all rush off to buy some. Sometimes we all have dumplings, sometimes fish. When one person buys something, the others do too. Generally, we get together pretty well. And on our time off, too. Three of us play the violin, one the monochord, and one the flute. We could give a little concert. <laughs> Attention, please. Travelers to Feng Tai, Yung Ting Men, and Peking are requested to use the crossing and to wait on the platform. The railway station, half an hour from Peking. <laughs> Attention, please. Let the passengers off before boarding. Do not let children run on the platform. They might fall and get hurt. It's practically empty. Here? Yes, here's fine. <laughs> Would you like a pair? I've brought lots of them for my daughter. Gao Shulan is going to join her husband in Peking. Let's not forget them. I'm so absent-minded. <laughs> so 
Sometimes I bring candy for Xiao Hong. <laughs> Do you bring her some every time? No, but this time my mother-in-law is sick. They have to stay indoors, so I'm bringing her some. When I was young, I used to help with the harvest, but I got bad blisters, so I had to stop. You weren't used to it. the central station. Everyone travels with a teacup and a few leaves of green tea. Boiling water is available everywhere in railway stations and trains. What are you doing? Don't you have school? No, we don't have school. We're following Lei Feng's example. We're cleaning up. Was it your idea to come here? Yes, we volunteered. Our teacher and classmates told us that other schools have already come here. Our classmates told us how to go about it. So we formed a group, and here we are. Do you do this often? Yes, a lot, after school. Attention please, train number 59, scheduled at 8.25 for Tengsheng, will be leaving in 10 minutes.
Will passengers please board the train? Passengers are requested to board promptly. The train will leave from platform number three. Attention please, do not spit on the floor. Please use the spittoons. If you drink, please empty your glass in the basin. Gao Shulan's husband. Like Gao Shulan, he comes from a peasant family. He's an officer in the Peking garrison, but he has to travel frequently. Gao Shulan says, I'm very talkative, but he's rather quiet. Aren't you going to give any to Daddy? Huh? Give some to Daddy. <laughs> Please don't push. Let the passengers off first.
Along the sidewalks, there are receptacles where people eating watermelons can throw their rinds in pits. This waste is collected and taken to the nearby countryside, where it is used as seed and food for the animals. This is a replica of a huge suspension bridge called the Tattoo Bridge. During the long march, the Red Army had to cross it, clinging to the chains and fighting at the same time. This is the most famous episode of the long march. How do you manage having a family and working at the same time? The family is very important to me. But it's not the most important thing. You can't let it take up all your time when you have to work and study too. We manage pretty well since my husband works near home. He can take care of our child part of the time. My mother-in-law treats me well and helps me in what I'm doing. Since I work far away, I only come home once a week. What qualities did you look for most in choosing your husband? Before getting married, I tried to picture the kind of man I would like. After thinking about it a lot, I decided he would have to be honest, politically sound, and have the same outlook on life as me, so we wouldn't argue later on. Perhaps there are still some women who believe they have to get married in order to have food and clothing. We fell in love in February 66. For two years, we were really a strange pair. We only went out to eat once. Neither of us wanted the other to pay. I was always thinking, it shouldn't come from his pocket. Whether or not our relationship developed, I didn't want to owe him anything. That's how it was for me and many other women too. Did you think about marriage a lot when you were a girl? No, I didn't. I got married at 25. No one forced me. I got married because I wanted to. It was during the Cultural Revolution. I took part in the Cultural Revolution with the women in my factory. With all that was going on, I didn't think much about my marriage. A little, of course, given my age. But not as much as I thought about all that was happening at the time. Do you ever disagree with your husband? 
We rarely argue. Except sometimes about our child, who's rather naughty. Sometimes I lose my temper and even spank her. Not hard, of course, but my husband disapproves. He believes in reasoning. He doesn't like me to spank her. Do you want another child? Yes, another. That's all you think about. Another one. Then you'll take care of it. Sure I will. Then I'll think about it. <laughs> the locomotive factory where Gao Shulan works is called the February 7th factory. On February 7th, 1923, the Chinese railroad workers went on strike for the first time. 60 of them were killed and 300 wounded. The diesel engines manufactured in the factory are assembled in this workshop. repair shop for old locomotives. organizes evening courses for the factory workers. What courses do you think we should have? Technical skills, I think. The older workers are already quite skilled. Technical courses would be better for the younger ones. What about the older ones then? Arts and sciences? <laughs> Arts and sciences, that's a good idea. I always make an investigation first, otherwise I'd be criticized. When we came here before, we spent some time at the factory. The factory was still in the midst of the Cultural Revolution. That's when we met Gao Shulan. At that time, she was in charge of a shop almost entirely composed of men, which caused many problems. Gao Shulan took us to a courtyard, introduced us to her family, and we became friends. Today, Gao Shulan is vice chairman of the Factory Workers' Union.
给他五分给我。老头，老头，给那个五分钱零的给我。Instead of going to the canteen, workers from outlying parts of the factory find it more convenient to get their meals from the lunch wagon. Do you know Kaushulan? Yes, I know her. She's been working at the February 7th factory since 1958. At that time, we were, we were in the same section. I was foreman, so we worked together. She was just 16. Just a little girl. She was rather shy and quiet. I've spoken with the workers in the north wing. They've asked me to pass on a few suggestions. They say there's a good variety of food, but if you're late, the portions are too small. In the evening, those who attend meetings criticizing revisionism often come late for dinner. They should be considered. Less variety, but larger portions. I think that would be better. That's what I wanted to say. Well, what about it? <laughs> I don't know what to say. We'll do all we can to find a solution, all right? Good, that's enough for now. We'll see about the rest later. In the North Wing, they make up their own menu. Oh, that's pretty good. Children can eat with their parents at the canteen. The nursery is just next door. There are also elementary and high schools on the factory grounds. Altogether, 5,000 children. There are more and more children at the nursery. We don't have enough space and supplies, especially in summer. We need some more sleeping room and a larger play area. The factory could help us with this problem. And we don't have enough toys for all the toddlers. We could use more, don't you think? We have the same problem with the playground. Small toys are all right, but the children need swings and slides for exercise. Couldn't we get more of these too? If we want our children to grow up healthy and develop morally, intellectually and physically, we should organize group activities that are also educational. Do any other mothers have questions? If we want healthy growing children, I think we should improve their food. For instance, the food given to seven-month-olds 
Has enough egg. But it needs more vegetables. It would help digestion. She started out as a welder. And after a while, she became very good at it. She's not afraid of carrying oxygen cylinders or, or of working in shop number two, where she's the only woman. Just after she came to the factory, she was given a responsible position in the shop. Then she became vice chairman of the entire workers union. She was very active, but in the beginning she was shy, like all the other girls. We helped her, and in the end we thought of her more like a boy than a girl. She's got a lot of courage and determination. That's for sure. People listen to her. But she also has her weaknesses, some weak points. She sometimes oversimplifies things. I think I know her better than the others. Her problem is she's too subjective. She doesn't make enough investigations. Well, she does, but they're not thorough. As Chairman Mao says, investigations are to be taken seriously and not done in a hurry. She's not precise. I think when she became a cadre, she was a little too proud and self-satisfied. We told her so. After that, she joined the party, right? <laughs> yes, that's right. She became overconfident when the party asked her to join. It went to her head. She can be very hard on herself. And she has very strong ties with the workers. She stays close to them, and they support her. Since she became vice chairman of the union, she hasn't cut herself off from the workers, at least not yet. She hasn't changed. As for the future, we'll see. During the Cultural Revolution, she was daring, and outspoken. And for a girl, she acted more like a boy. She had the courage to fight against the wrong tendencies. In the Cultural Revolution, she really went all out. Gao Shilan is an outstanding woman. She spoke out during the Cultural Revolution when no other women dared. She fought against the wrong political line. Not only that, but her class position is very solid. She stood up to the leaders who were following the capitalist path. At that time, Gao Shilan was really determined to fight. Class enemies, motivated by hate and fear, were trying to turn the people against each other, to crush the revolution. One time, during a big meeting, Gao Shilan was on the speaker's platform, attacking these leaders. A big fight broke out. People had been deceived by their leaders. Fists were flying, but as if nothing were happening, she continued explaining Chairman Mao's 16 points. You have to have been through a struggle with her to really know her. She was right there with us with you, you and me. We were all together, in the same group. We were all together during the Cultural Revolution. In the beginning, she was just like us, an ordinary militant. Yes, a woman like us, she held her ground, even when threatened. We respected her. And then there was the terrible raid. 
the night of January 12th. They tried three times to get their hands on Gao Shulan. Wasn't that November 11th, 1966? Then they brought the rebels to the factory. They beat them and made them kneel on benches. The factory was under heavy guard. It lasted more than six hours. The way she stood up to the enemy showed us how strong she was in her class position and in her convictions. And that's when we chose her as leader, right? We admired the way she kept on struggling. Everyone in the whole factory knew her. That's right. At times like that, you know, you know who the real leaders are in the midst of a struggle. Not only that, during the Cultural Revolution, when things were really hard, she fell in love. But she didn't even have time to write a letter. She worked even on Sundays. She really threw herself into the revolution. We admire her a lot. She's quite a woman. <laughs> A man could have done as much as she did. But in a sense, being a woman and having done all that makes her even stronger than us, so we were glad to vote for her. Even if a new cadre is a hard worker, it takes time to learn the job. Sometimes we're not satisfied, right? With her work. You mean her methods? Right. These are workers' children on the factory grounds. The factory is concerned with more than the production output of its 8,000 workers. It is concerned with the lives of 40,000 people. Some workers live far away. Many young people prefer not to live at home with their parents. Without waiting for the municipality to take the first step, the factory has decided to provide living quarters for them on its own grounds. A group of workers, elected to study the housing problem, visits a nearby construction site. Take notes on all this, will you? Let's try to come to some decision about the kind of housing we'd like and who's going to build it. This is just the kind of building we need. As we said before, instead of this kind, I'd prefer a low house because of my age. A one-story house would be better. A ground-level house. I don't think everyone agrees. For young people who live in dormitories, we could build higher. Since we're young, we don't mind the stairs. And tall buildings take up less ground space. It would be convenient for the workers if the houses were near the stores. I agree, but not only stores, bicycle shelters should be nearby too. There's a shortage of construction workers, but we need the housing. We'll need some help from the workers in every shop, and from the cadres, too. We should all take part. We can use 30% of the cadres, I mean 10%, and 30% of the workers, I mean 3%, right. For the last few days, I've been watching you shoot your film. I'm all for it. It's a good thing. But the rest of us, the workers, would like to warn Gao not to become too pretentious and proud. 
I'm sure you'll agree that doing this film about her, making her a star, you have to be careful, don't you think? She should work with us in the shop more often, otherwise she may fall into revisionism. So if comrades Marcelina and Evans could film some other women, in the March 8th group, Comrade Chang Wan Huan is outstanding. And Shui Zhou Lan, for example, she's a very good cadre. What sort of work do you do? We repair the machines. Our shop is in charge of maintenance. It has 353 workers. 83 are women. That's about 25% women. We're all fitters. Before, we could only watch the men work the machines. Some of them said, it's better to have one man working than two women. It's more profitable. They also said, long on hair, short on brains. All women can do is talk. Just after our March 8th group started out, we went into a shop to fix a broken lathe. When they saw we were all women, the men were annoyed. They wouldn't let us touch the machine. They said, it's not worth repairing. Take my case. I've been working here for 17 years. But I had to wait for the Cultural Revolution before I could play an active role in socialism. Do any of you have children? Yes. I have one child. I have one. I have three. The eldest is 15. She's in high school. You say women can do the same work as men. Do you think that's true the other way around? When my husband comes home, he takes care of everything. He does the laundry and cooks dinner. Our parents were shocked at first. They were offended. But when we explained, they understood. My father is 80. For him, housework has always been a job for women, not for his son-in-law. Some people say husbands who do housework are just like women. Sometimes my husband even washes my hair on Sundays. But at the nursery, it's still the women who take care of children. It needs more grease. How much? Yeah. Turn it. That should do it. Give it to me. Two sixty-five. 
Here's one. It's 84. Before liberation in 49, there were very few women in the factory. Feudal ideas were still dominant. People said, no women on locomotives, or we'll have accidents, people getting run over, exploding boilers. How did you become vice chairman of the union? As I recall, the union committee had submitted a list of 29 candidates. They printed it and handed it out to everyone. The workers said there weren't enough young candidates, so they made up a second list of their own with 31 names. This list was sent around, but the workers weren't satisfied yet. They said it was time for, for women to become cadres, and there weren't enough women on the list. In the end, they drew up a list of 37 candidates. How does your salary compare to a worker's? I don't have a very high salary, 47 yuan, like a grade 3 worker, but I'm still very happy with it. You say one of the union's jobs is to supervise the leaders. What does that mean exactly? As union cadres, we have to raise the level of consciousness of all the workers so they can participate in political life, in the revolution, and in the liberation of humanity. That way they'll be able to supervise their leaders. The workers see the union as a product of the class struggle and as a weapon in that struggle. There are still class enemies. Chairman Mao says, even in a socialist society, the class struggle continues. Class contradictions exist, and there's always the threat of capitalism. There will be no compromise when it comes to fighting the bourgeoisie and keeping its ideas from corrupting the working class. When we filmed you at the factory, some workers said they thought we were paying too much attention to you. What do you think? Yes, yes, I know. A lot of my friends and comrades have told me, Comrade Gao, the film is concentrating on you. That's fine. But don't let it go to your head. Don't cut yourself off from the workers. When the filming is over, we hope you'll come and work with us more often. The Cultural Revolution practically eliminated the union. The workers accused union leaders of working too much for the management. The leaders decided which job each worker would do, assigned the shops, and gave out individual bonuses. They spoke only about increasing production, and not in terms of class struggle and politics. As early as 1958, Mao Zedong had criticized these tendencies. But most union leaders paid no attention. Now, a new union is being created. It has three tasks political education, technical training, and improvement of living and working conditions for everyone.
Would you like to see how we used to make the coil springs? Come and see. Knowing about the past and not forgetting it is a political principle. This old piece of equipment is kept in a corner of the workshop. Before, we used to work with this thing from morning to night. By the end of the day, we could hardly even think. Ever since 1950, that's 23 years, I've worked in this shop. In 1965, I became foreman, and I'm still foreman. I've worked here since 58. I started before liberation, that's about 25 years. I've been here since 58 too, about 15 years. I'm an engineer. I graduated from the Institute of Technology. I work in engineering. I've been a worker on the coil spring crew since 58. I'm an engineer too, graduated in 62 from the Peking Metallurgical Institute. I've always worked here. Here we have a three-in-one group made up of cadres, technicians, and workers who take part equally in technological innovation projects. These three-in-one groups are being formed in all the shops. Before, we engineers never left our offices, so we didn't understand the workers' problems. And then when our blueprints didn't correspond to their needs, we got annoyed. Before the engineers laid down the law, they gave the orders, and the workers merely carried them out. Now all that's changed. We're all together. Production and innovation are done by workers and engineers together. With this machine, the main problem was threading. Since we, we stayed in our offices, well, not always, we didn't have the experience, the same experience as the workers. It was on the job with the workers that the problem of threading got solved. That's a good example. We learned from the engineers, too. Design and math were our weak points. We learned from one another. We teach them the practical side, and they teach us theory. We workers should depend on our own brains, not on the engineers. If we put our heads together, we'll succeed. Real knowledge comes from practice, too. Before the Cultural Revolution, workers weren't allowed to modify machines. They couldn't make any changes at all, not even a screw. That's how it was. In order to combat the division between intellectual and manual work, between engineers and workers, technological innovation has become a mass movement. It's one of the great achievements of the Cultural Revolution. Every workshop is responsible for collecting its scrap metal, iron filings, and copper shavings. It's all sent to this factory recycling center.
The scrap is melted and made into bullions. Each day, hundreds of pounds of different metals are salvaged this way. By the end of the year, this adds up to several hundred tons. This takes place in all of China's factories. way of avoiding waste. In this shop, old freight cars are stripped and the wood is used in making composition board. Housewives and retired workers of the neighborhood have organized a sort of recycling shop in the factory. They own the shop collectively. They salvage oil and cotton from pads attached to freight car axles. Centrifuge is used to extract the last drops of oil. The salvaged cotton, mixed with new cotton, is used to make new pads. Cold dust used to fall all around here. It got in your eyes. You couldn't see. You couldn't eat outside or even sit outside in the evening. You couldn't hang laundry out to dry. You couldn't even stand here. Everyone kept a towel around his neck. By morning, the ground was black with dust. The party paid a lot of attention to this problem. 
Workers, technicians and cadres in the three-in-one group solved it fast. It took us over a month to build the first dust trap. We built three more in the next month. There's been an international conference on pollution. Every country is concerned. As for us, at first, we didn't see the problem clearly. But now that our own industry is developing, we'll be faced with it too. We've got to solve it for the sake of future generations. Take Japan, England, or the United States. The fish are almost gone from the rivers. You can't even swim anymore. The water is so dirty. If you want to swim, you have to wade through garbage, parts of old cars, along the shore. The beaches are ruined. Industrial waste is contaminating the sea. Money is not our main concern. For instance, this system, without the dust trap, cost about 10,000 yuan. With the dust trap, it costs a lot more. But even if it costs 10 times as much, the workers' health and preserving the environment come first. To get rid of the dust, we developed this system. We thought it could only be used to pick up the dust. We didn't know the dust could be used as fuel by the workers. We tried it out. It burns well. It's pretty good. Everyone can get some in exchange for a coupon. It's free. You just have to carry it away. We've been doing it like this for a year. We use one-ton carts to remove it. In winter, 10 tons are carried away each day. A lot of workers are using this fuel. Two carts of dust mixed with one of coal can supply the yearly cooking and heating needs of a family of 10. Coal dust mixed with water makes a kind of mud. This mud is dried and made into briquettes for cooking and heating. You bought another pair of pants? Why not? I only have one. I only have one. What's done is done. I only have one granddaughter. Let's see. She's bought some more pants. Now your brother will want some too. That's right. And a new jacket too. Your sister works, you don't. So what? What's the difference? All you two care about is your own personal comfort. You say, things are better now. Can't young people dress better too? But you mustn't forget the past. Our parents were poor peasants. And you, after a month's work, you bought yourself a shawl and leather shoes. Your aunt, after 10 years of work, doesn't have as much. 
All you young people think about is good food and fancy clothes. That's not good. You mustn't forget the people who are suffering throughout the world. Don't you think so? You never listen to your father. Things can't go on like this. What's done is done. But watch out in the future. I don't mind if you wear them now. But remember the hardships of the past. All right. Go help your mother with dinner. Anyway, in my day, you couldn't find such fine cloth. You should remind them about the past so they'll appreciate the present. The more often they're reminded, the more they'll progress. But I'm always telling them about the old society. With those two, you shouldn't be afraid to repeat yourself. I keep them both very busy, carrying water, for instance. It's not so easy. That's true. I never stop scrubbing, cleaning, sweeping, and taking care of you. Of course, do you want your grandmother to do it? What about my jacket, then? Nothing's wrong with this one. All your clothes are new, and so are your shoes and your socks.
Three children are enough, huh? You better stop. If you don't, you'll be criticized. <laughs> Do the neighbors intervene when a husband and wife have disagreements? <laughs> I guess that's a way of asking if we help them to make up. Help them make up. When a husband and wife quarrel and there are fights, the neighbors come and try to calm things down. They usually make up all by themselves. Big Xu and her husband Yao Cheng had a fight about their child, who misbehaves a lot. They were worried. They thought they weren't bringing him up right. But since the last fight, things have been calm. <laughs> <laughs> These fights aren't really serious. An old proverb says, no point in trying to stop fights between husband and wife. When the table's set, they'll sit down to eat. <laughs> I work as a fitter in the locomotive and rolling stock plant, the February 7th factory. Right now, I'm working in the technological innovation section. <laughs> I work with Ling at the February 7th factory. I'm in the innovation group, too. I work on a lathe. I'm a welder in the finishing shop at the same factory. We all work at the same factory. I'm a plumber. I take care of central heating. I'm an exception. I don't work in the same factory. I work somewhere else. I'm a cook at the Peking Transport Company, Section 11. A cook, that's handy. We all work at the February 7th factory. I'm a machinist. <laughs> I work at the car repair factory in the Fengtai district of Peking. I'm vice chairman of the Revolutionary Committee. There are more than 600 workers in the factory. He's a big shot. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>